In the next four videos, we're going to take a look at deep learning and how it can help us with natural language processing. We will study some of the general features of some deep learning architectures, and in your weekly exercises, you will look at the details of their implementation, and you will get to run them by yourself. The first thing we will do is that we'll talk about how we can process sequences of elements, sequences of inputs. For example, sequences of words. And before we do that, let's take a very quick uh, look at the word deep learning. It sounds very modern, very cool, but the truth is, it is cool, but the concept is not new. It is a rebranding of a concept that has been around since the 1940s. If you remember from week two of our class, uh, was this week one or two? We looked at the history of new, uh, artificial intelligence and natural language processing. And we saw that some of it came from the 1940s and 50s, where we had, where people invented um, perceptrons and large new, uh, databases, and people were very hopeful about artificial intelligence. And then woo, uh, the early neural networks didn't behave as well as people expected. The first perceptrons had a lot of trouble learning, and so we faced an artificial intelligence winter. During the 1970s, people uh, couldn't do research in neural networks if they wanted funding. In the 1980s, the widespread implementation of algorithms like backpropagation helped uh, in the training of neural networks, and uh, there were renewed hopes for how it would work. However, there wasn't enough data to train those networks, and the hardware was just not at a point where it could handle very large neural networks. So we came to a second artificial intelligence winter. In the 21st century, we have seen a lot of growth in uh, the use of neural networks, what we now call deep learning, because we have um, better computers uh, that can process networks of literally millions of weights and elements. We have more data. We have larger databases now, which can help us with the learning process. And in general, people have implemented some amazing algorithms. For example, um, attention, like we're going to study later. These can really help in the learning process. And that's why deep learning is uh, such a popular set of tools these days, because it's, it's going through a spring. In general, what we mean by deep learning is um, neural networks that have, that are very richly connected that have hidden layers and that have rich connection between layers, between neurons and between elements. So rich that they're beginning to, to resemble, at least in size, elements of the natural world. So for example, this is a chart of how many connections uh, this each neuron have for things like mice and cats. So you can see for mice, for example, each neuron has about a thousand connections to other neurons. And this is the same level as uh, an algorithm called distributed autoencoder from 2012, where you would have each neuron with a thousand connections to other elements. So um, this, uh, the current state of hardware, of uh, this parallelism in processing, and our larger databases have allowed us to uh, train larger and larger models. So large, in fact, that this the state of the art is models that are very large. So, for example, this is from the last two years. Um, the state of the art system for uh, deep learning and natural language processing is called the transformers. It's a family of algorithms. So, for example, the Roberta and the Distilbert on the right are kinds of uh, transformers. There are a special transformer called the Bert. They have the Roberta has 355 million uh, parameters that need adjusted, so 355 million connections between elements. Imagine training 355 million of those. In our example from the first video this week, we had, what, two connections? Um, the large BERT from Google AI in, 2000, in the end of 2018 had 340 million connections. And I reduced the chart because, for example, in January of this year, Microsoft released one called um, TNLG. The T is for Turing, natural language generation, and it has 17 billion connections. So you couldn't even run this on, on 
a regular computer. You would need a large number of GPUs and a lot of parallelism to even load these models. Why has this complexity gone rampant? Why do we need so much complexity? It's so we can deal with that old nemesis of ours that has been popping up since week two, long distance dependencies. If you have a paragraph like, I grew up in France and I was, it was just an amazing childhood. We played on the street and I hung out with all the other kids. So I ended up speaking fluent and you know what's coming up. This word here, fluent French, depends on something that I saw 29 words ago. And throughout the class, we've been talking about how difficult it is to model this. In finite state machines, you cannot look back 29 states to figure out that French is connected with France. To do it with n-grams, you would need a 29-gram. Um, to do it with a word to vec, you would need an immense window for it to capture something that was 29 words away. So the algorithms we've studied so far have a very hard time modeling long distance dependencies. And the, this complexity of neural networks will allow them to model very uh, nonlinear functions, including these kinds of dependencies. And we're going to study a very important example in how we can do this. For example, if you had a neural network where the input was a word and the output was the next word, so a predictor of what comes next. So let's say if you give it the word I, it gives you the word GRU, and then it takes the word GRU and it predicts the word UP, and so on for I grew up in France. If we have a neural network that just takes one word as input and gives you one word as output, for example, GRU UP, there's no way for this to know anything about its surrounding words. Um, GRU has some characteristics and some things that I was um, surround, some adjacent words in the training input, but there's no way that it can look at its local input when it gets the sentence. So it's going to generate some prediction for GRU that is independent of the fact that it was preceded by I and followed by UP. Um, so why can't we have some sort of richer connection between networks? For example, where we run a neural network and we produce our output, but then we also produce a second type of output, which is some information about the word GRU that's going to go on to the next uh, running of the neural network. So for example, I predicts GRU and we get the output GRU, but then we have an element that remembers somehow that the word that I saw was I. So when you have the second input, which is GRU, it has GRU and I as inputs. So it can see the local word that it's processing and some information from previous words that it's processed. If a neural network did this, this was it would constitute a kind of memory of what happened before. This concept is called a recurrent neural network. This is what one of them looks in its folded presentation. A recurrent neural network um, takes a sequence of inputs. So for example, it, it always has the input layer red that we have there, uh, the X input. It has some hidden layers in the green uh, box, and then it has an output layer in the blue elements Y. So it gets the input, it processes some output, but it also produces a second output, which is an, um, some vector H. This is going to contain information about the input X. So you take X and produce the output Y and the vector H, which contains some information about X. And so in the next running of the network, the when you execute it for the next element in the sequence, you will take the second input word and H. So this will have a memory of some information of what came in before. And so for every execution of this neural network, you produce two outputs, the prediction Y based on the input X 
and some output vector h which has information about the x's that came before. This is what a recurrent neural network looks like unfolded. By the way, I want to be very clear about this. The green box there is always the same network. This is just one, which you can see on the right. It's just that we're going to unfold it across time. So for example, if the first word you get is the word grew as your input x, the, way, the hidden layers in the green box are going to produce two outputs. The prediction that the word up is the following word, and then an element ht, which has information about gru, about the input x at the time zero. Let's go to the next time step, time step one. This will have two inputs, the input up, which we just produced, and the element ht, which has element about the word, uh, a memory of the word grew. So it takes, in practice, grew up. And then from these two, it produces two things. The prediction for y at time step one, in, and then another ht, which is a vector that contains some memory that the previous elements were up and grew. And with this ht, we go on to the next time step, t2, the input is in, and then the vector that contains a memory of grew up. And it takes these two elements and produces two outputs. The prediction France for the time step T2 and the, vector, and the new vector H, which has some memory of the fact that the preceding words were in, up, and grew. So this is what it looks, again, in its unfolded state. Where, where the time steps are represented separately, even though it's always the same network, the layers in the green elements are always the same. So for every input x, we have two outputs. The output y, which is our prediction that the network generates, and then the h element, which is the information that is going to be carried across to the next execution of the neural network. So it works something like this. This is a recurrent neural network so that for every input x at the time step t, it takes in the, a vector h based on the information it saw before. The input xt runs those through a neural network, through a feedforward network, and produces an output yt, which is the prediction of what, for example, what the, the word that follows this one. It produces yt, but it also produces a vector that now incorporates information about everything that it saw before. That's what a recurrent neural network is trying to do. Another example would be to take spectrographic information and try to, pre to predict uh, the consonant and vowel associated to it. So for x1 is some chunk of a spectrogram that contains the information you take that, run it through the network, and produce two outputs. Y1, which is the prediction that that sound is k, and then H1, which is some information about the, the spectrogram X1. This enters the second time step, which is the spectrogram X2, and then some information about the spectrogram X1. These two go together, and then you get the prediction Y2. Ah... Uh, and then a vector h2, which contains some information about the inputs x2 and x1. Then h2 enters into the third time step with x3, which can presumably contains the sound t. So t, the spectrogram for t and the h2 uh, vector enter the third time step you process them through a feedforward neural network, and then you get two outputs, the prediction y3, t, and then h3, which has some information. It's a vector containing information about x3, x2, and x1, and so forth. You might have noticed an interesting problem about this. The signal diminishes over time. The vector h3 will probably preserve a lot of information about the input x3, but only a little about x2, probably only a little about x1, and as you move further back, the signal will diminish. 
We call this the vanishing gradient problem, where the further down in time you go, the weaker the first signals become. So as you move through time, these, these first signals are going to become weaker and weaker and weaker as they are overwritten by the H memory of uh, the following elements of the sequence. So the vanishing gradient is uh, the problem that you're forgetting the information that you saw first as it's overwritten by the, the successive information. This is, there's been many attempts at trying to solve this problem. I'm going to show you very briefly one solution that was very popular for a long time. And a long time means the, the between in the beginning from 2010 to 2015. Um, as, and as you can see, it's called a long short term memory. Let me show this one to you very briefly. And then in following videos, we will look at the state of the art, which is called attention. So in recurrent neural networks, we had that we had the, we had some vector that had a memory of things that came before. However, this memory decreased over time. So maybe we could explicitly tell the network what to remember and what to forget. Long short term memory networks have two inputs from preceding states. Uh, one that's the H, which is just the information from previous words, and something called the cell state, which is also the information from previous words, but it is specifically tempered by two functions here. As you can see, we have a fairly complex uh, set of a cell. It's a set of four neural networks. So here we have the input at the time step t, the input x, we run it through a neural network and then we get a sigmoid activation function. And this is going to tell us how much of the current input we should remember. So this is going to help us record information into the cell state. So this is telling, for example, if it has the word it as the input, this network should tell us that the word it shouldn't be something you remember that much. Probably if it has the word chlorophyll, it should tell you that the word chlorophyll should be something that you remember very much. It has a second neural network here with a tangent uh, ton, um, activation function that tells you how much of previous things you should forget. So for example, if two paragraphs ago you had the word it, but then here you have a new it, you should remember the, uh, the new it, the one you just heard and you should try to forget the one you heard long ago because it might no longer be relevant. So it has a second neural network to tell you how much you should forget from previous states. So you do get input from other iterations of the network, but you also get a channel that is dedicated to remembering and forgetting. And we call that the cell state. And it runs in a way similar to recur uh, recurrent neural networks where you have taken input, a time step, t minus one, generate an output, which can be, for example, a prediction of the next word, um, etc. And from there, you transfer a, an H vector for memory, but also a cell state vector that tells that gives you more details on what you should remember and what you should forget. And you keep on going with your inputs and your outputs. So what do we have so far? Deep learning studies neural networks with richer connections between neurons, not just many connections, but richer ones, as we have seen here, where you don't just do a prediction between layers, but also feed information into a future neural network. This is what recurrent neural networks do. They have connections to elements they have seen before, so they can use this information when they make predictions. And fortunately, the information from previous iterations can vanish. This is the vanishing gradient because it goes, it, it stays further and further back in time. There's many solutions to this. One is a, the long short term memory neural networks, which have a dedicated channel so you can select what to remember and what to forget as you go. The state of the art right now uses an algorithm called attention, which we will study next.